Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Better have a seat. Because uh, I got to... No, it's not. Hey, there it is. John chapter 11. Y'all can just stay seated. I'm not going to make you get up again. I just, I thought it was going to take a lot longer. We're going to read verses 11 through 28 or 11, 28 through 44. When she had said this, she went and called her sister Mary, saying in private, the teacher is here and is calling for you. And when she heard it, she rose quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was still in the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who were with her in the house, consoling her, saw Mary rise quickly and go out, they followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to weep there. Now when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been there, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. And he said, Where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. So the Jews said, See how he loved him? But some of them said, Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man also have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor. For he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me. But on, I said <clears throat> this on account of the people standing around me, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said these things, he cried in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The man who had died came out, his hands and feet bound with linen strips, and his face wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, Unbind him and let him go. Father, be with us, Lord. In this, Lord, I pray that the word speaks to us today. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right. So to call the Gospels the Gospels, not really accurate. I, I, I don't really like it. it, it I know it, it sounds kind of odd, right? We call it the Gospels. But what Gospel means is good news. And some of the things that are said in the, in, in the Gospels are not necessarily good news. They're not necessarily the things that, that inspire hope. When Jesus says, if you look at a woman to lust after her, you have committed adultery in your heart and your punishment is hell. That's not good news. If you're angry with your brother, that, that means you're a murderer in your heart. That's not good news. That's in Matthew, if you guys need to know. But that's not real good news. Not everything that is written in the Gospels are good news. <clears throat> One of the things that we miss a lot of times is that Jesus preached more law than he did gospel. Jesus lived under the Mosaic Covenant. Jesus lived under the Old Covenant. Jesus lived under the law. He was born under the law so that he could fulfill the law on behalf of his people, die for the sins of those that he was standing for, and then rise again from the grave so that he could conquer sin and death on behalf of his people. <clears throat> I think, my opinion, since the Gospels are actually just accounts of Jesus' life, that we, would call, we could call them the life and times of Jesus. Or the story of the Savior. There's all kinds of things. But the purpose of the Gospels are to tell us about Jesus, about how he lived, about 
some of the things that he taught. And, and, and John at the end says, this isn't everything that Jesus taught. This isn't everything that he was saying. I've only written these things so that you could know that Jesus is the Son of God and that by faith in him you would have life. That's the point of the Gospels. That's the point of John especially is for us to have faith that Jesus is the Son of God and by that we would have life. And I know so, those of you guys that have been here for a while are like, come on, Pastor Man, you're beating a dead horse. But this dead horse that I'm beating is where you have hope. Amen. So, apart from that dead horse that I keep beating about faith in Christ and faith in Christ and faith in Christ and faith in Christ, that is our only hope. Yes, sir. Amen. Yes, sir. That's our only hope. So I'm going to continue to beat that horse yeah. until you get it. And then after you get it, I'm going to beat it some more. Yes. Come on. Because we need it reiterated to us over and over and over again. We need to re be reminded of the gospel over and over and over again because we're dumb. We, yeah. we are dumb. Amen. All of us. We forget Yes, that we are saved by grace. We forget these things because we always try to go back to works and we always try to go back to these things that captivate us and, and, and hold us down and bear a weight on us that we cannot manage. Because what happens when, when we start thinking about our salvation? We're like, okay, but I did this. Okay. Not by works, but by faith. But, 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 but I did this. Pastor, or, 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 or Lord, I messed up today. Okay? But we're saved by grace. <coughs> John is about faith. <coughs> Knowing that Jesus is God in the flesh and that he is the Savior of his people. And he gives us life. So these stories of Jesus are meant for us to get to know who he is and his character. <clears throat> and it's important. That's, that's why we're going to start walking through theology is so that we can know him more. Because <clears throat> that's, that, that's the point. I'm going to explain all that on Tuesday. But remember a couple things. If you, Jesus said, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. This is how we know God is by looking at Christ. It says, I and the Father are one. So we look at that. And then, and then also Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. His salvation was sure in, in the Old Testament during the time that he walked as well as today that his plan is to save a people for himself. His attributes don't change. Yes, the way that he operated through history was a little bit different. In, in, in the Old Testament, uh, there was signs and shadows and types that, that would come into fulfillment. And then when it came into fulfillment, we didn't need the old stuff anymore. All that old stuff was obsolete. The covenant was obsolete because we are now under the new covenant where everything is fulfilled. And then after he, he died and rose again and he commissioned the, the, the people, there were some things that were going on there in order to start the church, to establish the church. But after the, the, the first century, the church age, some of those things passed away. And now we are in this age of waiting for Christ to return and for us to go home. Constantly waiting. But his attributes do not change. For a time, he walked in the flesh. And there were some things that he couldn't do while he was in the flesh. <clears throat> but he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. <clears throat> so I just want to catch us up <clears throat> just a little bit, little bit. Lazarus fell sick. His sisters, Martha and Mary, sent word to Jesus. I'm sure that they were hoping that he would, oh, crap. I gotta go. Dude's sick. I'm gonna go heal him. But his friend was sick, so he stayed for two more days. And then he tells the disciples, hey, we need to go wake up Lazarus. And they're like, dude, if he's sleeping, he's gonna get up. Come on. And, and I like Jesus, like, look, he's dead. We gotta go. And he says, look, he's dead. And I'm so glad that we weren't there when he died. So that you can see what I'm about to do. 
That's, that's basically what he's saying. Because of what he was about to do, it's good that he was in the grave for four days. It's good for that. You know what's funny? Um, the guy that preached the funeral yesterday preached this exact same pa pa passage. I was like, man, that's yeah. weird. <clears throat> Jesus and disciples go to Bethany. And Martha... Martha is the busy sister. She, he, she's the, the doer. The, she's in it. She's, she, you know, the, uh, in Luke, there's an account of her, her sweeping around and, and just trying to get everything ready for the dinner party and all that. And Mary, her sister, is just sitting at the feet. And she starts complaining. Hey, hey, aren't you going to tell her to help me? It's like, hey, she's fine. Just leave, leave her be. She picked a little better. But Martha goes and says, if you would have been here, my brother would still be alive. And Jesus says, your brother will live again. So, yeah, I know. At the, the last day, at the resurrection, you know, when everybody's resurrected, yeah, I know. And then Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. And that whoever believes me, yet he lives, he will never die. And he says, do you believe this? And then she says, I'm going to read verse 27, says, yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God who is coming into the world. That's a huge profession of faith. Last week we, 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 we talked about it. it. It wasn't flesh and blood that revealed that to her, but the Father revealed. The, the only way that we can confess Christ is if the Father reveals him to us, if our hearts are open and, and, and he does this. So Mary and Martha, they're two very different people. Martha is a, is, is a thoughtful, purposeful in, in, in all of her interactions. She's kind of a stoic kind of person, kind of like, uh, she's not overly emotional, you know, because it doesn't say that she approached him weeping. She just says that he went to, she went to Jesus and said, Lord, if you'd been here, you'd, you'd be alive. And I know people that if, if this wasn't written down, if this was just an account of, uh, of someone like being passed on or, or saw these two encounters, they, they might say that Martha doesn't really love Jesus because she, she didn't, her, she wasn't overly emotional. She wasn't, you know, struggling and all this, but she was very stoic in her thoughts and very thoughtful in the way that she approached things and, and, and very uh, like level. Now, some people are, 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 are calm and level, and then some people are, are crazy emotional. Now, I'm not saying anything negative in, in either manner. I'm just saying people are different. And, and, and you can kind of see that, that, that Christ approaches them. Jesus deals with them in a different manner. When, when, when Martha approached, he spoke truth. Just to, not, not say that he lied to Mary. Don't, don't get that wrong. But he spoke truth. He's like, yes, I am the resurrection and the life. I am this, I am that. Do you believe this? She's like, yeah, I believe that. But Mary, you look at Mary. I'm, I'm going to read a little bit of this. Verse 28. When she had said this, you know, this was Martha. She had gone and called her sister and said, the teacher is here calling for you. And when she heard it, she rose quickly and went to him. And Jesus had not yet come into the village, but, he, but was still in the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who, who were with her uh, in the house consoling her saw Mary rise quickly and go out, they followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to weep there. Now look at, look at the way Mary approaches Jesus, though. It says, Now when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet, saying, Lord, if you would have been here, my brother would not have died. And notice, look, look, look at the way that, that Jesus responds to Mary as opposed to Martha. She says, when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. He dealt with Mary in a different manner than he dealt with Martha. And it's not, it's not that one way was better than the other, but he was dealing with Martha on more of a theological level. And in, 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 in that kind of level where, where Mar Mary was emotional and he met her in her emotion. It says that he was deeply moved in his spirit, that his heart was moved by her.
Mary comes, there's a whole bunch of people. There's people that were hired to weep and hired to mourn. And, 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 and other people were coming to, to console and to weep and to mourn with people. And this whole group came. And he was moved by their emotion. <clears throat> He's not saying that there's no compassion given with Martha. He just knew how to deal with her in a different way than he dealt with Mary. You, 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 can even, you can even see that in your interactions. There's ways that you deal with one person that's different than the way that you deal with another person. People respond to everything differently. People are, are different. And once you get to know people, you know how to respond to them and, you, and, 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 and things go in different manners. There's some people I can cut it straight. And other people can't. I'm not real good with that. Here's a real life scenario though. When tragedy strikes, people need different things. When you're giving care to, just, just for example, when you're giving care to a family that lost a child, you know, I've never lost a child, but losing a child has gotta be devastating for a parent. Oh. That's, for most people, if I were to go and try to console, I wouldn't go and say, hey, God is sovereign, bro. He has a plan. He took him. It's fine. Just trust God. That's not what people need to hear at the time, at, at the broke, most broken parts of their lives. When people get a hold of me saying, I messed up again. I need to come back. That's not the time when I say, well, you're an idiot. I wait till they sober up and then I tell them they're an idiot. <clears throat> Amen. You know when people are broken and hurting, it's not the time to, to just lay out theological truths. That's when people just need you. Just need your presence. Just need you to console them. And that, that's kind of the way that he deals with them. Although truth is not always helpful. Those of you guys that know me know I'm not very good at that part of it. Uh, see, I can't even do it. In, uh, <laughs> but just to sit with someone in compassion, that's what he was doing with Mary. Because <clears throat> the reality is that if someone loses everyone around them, they don't just need to hear God has a plan. But there's a couple things that, that we see in this passage, though. Christ's humanity. I'm going to pick up in 33. It says, When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. And he said, Where have you laid him? They said, Lord, come and see. And Jesus wept. So the Jews said, See how he loved him? But some of them said, Could not he who opened the eyes of a blind man also have kept this man from dying. We can see the heart of Christ here, though. In his humanity, he, he felt human emotion. He sympathized with Mary and the, those that were around her hurting. He knew what was exactly what was coming next. He knew what he was about to do because he knew beforehand. He knew when they were first got the news, hey, we're going to go wake him up. He knew what was about to happen, but that doesn't, didn't save him or, or keep him from the compassion. It didn't keep him from, from weeping with those who were hurting. It didn't keep him from not getting in the paint with them, so to say. It didn't keep, them, keep him from just being uh, stoic and theological and, 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 and stepping back and hard-hearted and just saying, just trust the Lord. Da, da, da. He didn't, it didn't keep him from that. He got down with them and weeped with them. There's all kinds of different ideas of what he was doing, why he weeped, and I don't care. Because a lot of people will get into some weird, 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 weird things. But Romans 12, verse 15 says, Rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn. 
And I think that that's what Christ was doing right there. He was mourning with those who were mourning. We can see his heart there, his humanity. He had compassion for his friend who lost their brother. His humanity is, is, is utterly vital to our walk. Jesus had to be in the flesh. Uh, Hebrews 9 says that without the shedding of blood, there is no sacrifice for sin. So that, that's, that's a, a sacrificial reason for him in the flesh. But there's another reason. In Hebrews 4, 15, it says, We do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize. He goes on to say more, but I'm not. That, that, but I'm going to stop there because that's the heart. Jesus walked this earth so that he knows the heart and the struggles of his people. He knows the, the, the hurts that, and the loss that people go through. He understands his friend just died. Even though that he knew that he was about to raise him from the dead, that didn't keep him from going and sympathizing with his people, with his friends. He felt the hardship, the pain of a sin-soaked world but was able to walk without sin. His humanity was one part of his being. He was truly man, 100% man. He wasn't like 50% God, 50% man. He was truly God and he was truly man. Let's pick up in 38. It says, Then Jesus deeply moved again came to the tomb it was a cave and a stone lay against it Jesus said take away the stone Martha the sister of the dead man said to him Lord by this time there will be an odor for he has been dead four days Jesus said to her did I not tell you that if you believed you would see the glory of God so he took away the stone and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said Father I thank you that you have heard me I knew that you always hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing around, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The man who had died came out, his hands and feet bound with linen strips, and his face wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to, him, to them, unbind him and let him go. He knew what he was coming to do with Lazarus, and his heart was still moved in his in his humanity, but that does not take away from his divinity, from him being God. We have a hard time grasping the, the, the hypostatic union where, where Jesus was truly God and truly man, where the, the union of those two natures and, and how his nature was, was not sinful like our nature is sinful. We were born in sin. We were born with the sin nature. Jesus was not. Jesus was born perfectly. Even though he is 100% fully human, sin nature's got to be passed down from your father because his father was divine. And so the nature that he received was not the same nature that we got. The nature that we got was, was sinful in our womb, in, in, in our mother's womb. We were sinful. We were set to death to, to be destroyed until God did something. His nature was perfect. His nature was sinless. But that's what it took in order to pay the penalty for our sin is that sin can't pay for sin. That's why nobody can pay for themselves or anybody else. It takes perfection. So he goes and he says, take away the stone. Martha, being the, the person that she is, whoa, 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 whoa. He's gonna stink. <laughs> no, don't move that stone. He's gonna stink. He's been dead for four days. Now, there are a lot of things that happened in those four days. Um, the Jews <clears throat> believed that their, his spirit would hang around for three days and then after that, take off. It's done. <clears throat> but on the other side of that, decay would start setting in. Uh, rigor mortis, all, this, all, all the stuff that happens to dead people would really start setting in after four days. When she confessed 
Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who has come into the world. She believed that, confession, all that stuff. When it came to the walk, she's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Don't move that stone, he's going to stink. There is an odor. So even though in, 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 in thought and in, 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 in heart, it her faith was there. She knew that Jesus was the Christ. But in reality, there was a struggle. There was a struggle in actually walking out the faith that she had. There was a struggle in the practical application of the faith that she had. There was a struggle in, in believing that he was actually going to raise him from the dead. Because she's like, whoa, 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 there's an odor there. We can't be doing this. There, there's, there's dead things in there. That's how we are. Come set free. Faith starts getting built up. Right? We confess Christ. Sit in the classroom for three months, however many months. <laughs> getting soaked in the Word of God. Getting just absolutely poured into in the Word of God. And the Word of God starts to open up to you. The Word of God starts to do its work in you. And you're like, I think, I think this is true. I believe that Jesus is the Christ. I believe that He is the Son of God. I believe that He is the only hope that I have. I believe that, that He is the way. I believe that He is the truth. I believe that He is the life. And, and all this stuff is, is, is set in. And we're like, yes, I believe. <clears throat> and then comes life. That impractical, that 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 thing that's just not supposed to be that way. That rolling of the stone, that the thing. No, 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 no. He's dead. He's dead. You you can't roll the stone. But Jesus just you just confess that you believe Jesus. You just confess all this stuff. But when God starts to lead us in something, our hearts start to stop. We're like, whoa, 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 whoa. This does not make sense. How is this gonna work? We start to become like Mary and, 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 and things, the impractical things don't make any sense. You can't move the stone, he's dead. Yes, but you just confess that I'm the son of God. God, I know, I know that you can do this, but I don't think that you will. I know that, that, that you can do all things. I know everything is in your hands. I know my salvation, my eternity is in your hands, but... It doesn't really matter what comes after that, but. But it just doesn't make any sense. This is illogical. It, it, it doesn't, God, this cannot happen. This doesn't make any sense. What do you mean, quit my job? What do you mean to trust you? What do you mean? I have to do this. I have to do that. What do you mean? What do you mean go across the country? to follow you. What do you mean to give up what I want to serve others? That doesn't make any sense at all. I got to do my own thing. When faith gets tested, that's when our strength starts to waver. When things start to, to, to get hard and we can't trust, we're like, okay, we're supposed to trust God, but we don't know how to trust God because now things are getting real. Yeah. 